follow after the one who gave it all Christ alone be praised fully devoted we follow after the one who gave it all Christ alone Christ alone be morning. Uh, whether you're here with us or joining us online, um, I would like to welcome you to Encounter Church. Um, if you are here with us for the first time, um, I would like to extend a special welcome to you. Uh, we believe that 
here at Encounter, uh, this next hour can be one of the most helpful and hopeful over the rest of your week. Uh, over the next 45 minutes, uh, we will have a couple of things. Um, we're going to have sing a few more songs. Uh, we are going to uh, have a time of prayer and uh, hear a message from Pastor Chris. If you're joining us for the first time or if you've been coming, we also have an app for you. Uh, it is encounterchurch.com backslash app. On this app, you can follow along with today's message. You can let us know how we can pray for you. Uh, and uh, you can also introduce yourselves to us. If you prefer to let us know that you know, you're here with us the old fashioned way, uh, you can actually fill out the connection card that uh, was given to you when you walked in this morning. We'll collect those later on in service. Um, again, we just wanna be able to welcome you. We're glad that you're here. We want you to be able to uh, really take in everything as we continue with our sermon series about guardrails. But before that, let's sing a few more songs. Thank you. Bye. 
I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me Good morning and welcome to Encounter Church. Um, when I was younger, uh, I, there was this kind of this first moment I ever experienced a hurricane. We, uh, I grew up in a kind of a part of America where uh, hurricanes are pretty frequent. And I remember this really intense one. It was, I think it's still considered to be one of the kind of on that ratings of most destructive hurricanes ever um, to be still pretty, pretty high up there. And I remember it coming through um, almost exactly where I lived. And um, living and just kind of feeling the house shake and the lightning and it was this intense storm and then I remember this crazy moment and we'd been watching the weather and so we knew it was about to happen I didn't know what it was as a small kid I just knew that the eye of the storm was about to pass over like literally our house and so I remember being uh, some of the adults that were all kind of kind of kind of huddled up in, in the space we were said hey you need to come outside and I remember you know, it's just this intense storm, and then you walk outside, and the skies are blue. And, I mean, and it's clear destruction has just happened. And, and yet, like, it's just still, and it's peaceful. And, um, and it's just this crazy, crazy experience that marked me. And then uh, becoming a Christian, one of the things that is kind of central to the Christian faith is peace and joy. That there's this promise of peace, there's this promise of joy, and, and it goes above our circumstances. It, even in the midst of difficulties, you can still have peace and you can still have joy and tragedy. And, and to, I, I go back to that moment in my childhood because I feel like that captures so often that promise of what God has um, offered to us, of peace. In the midst of a storm, stillness. In the midst of blowing winds and just crashing waves, this kind of security that it's okay. And that, that peace and that joy, and maybe you're here for the first time, and let me go ahead and call out probably what you thought when you walked in. You're like, okay, first of all, that band is really good. Okay? Right? Because phenomenal. And number two, on that first song, you're like, did we come to church or a concert? Right? Right? And you're like, they're so upbeat and like, shouldn't there, I don't know, be fog and lights or something and tickets? Like, shouldn't people be charging for this? And one of the reasons that there's such this upbeatness to even the first song we sing is because we believe joy is not something out there that we can never get to, that it's reserved for some like special elite of some spiritual class, but that joy and peace are promised for everyone. That it is a promise that you and I can experience. And that's why when you walked in, we're celebrating because we still believe there's something worth celebrating even in the midst of difficult circumstances. And just for you to receive that and know that there is joy and that there is peace promised to you. And, and I recognize maybe you've come in and in the midst of your marriage, or in the midst of kind of a rough season at work or with family, that you're like, I don't know if I've got the faith or, or the strength to reach out for that promise. And I just would like to lean in and say, it's okay, I do. And, and I just want to pray that for you and just pray that wherever we are, whether we're in the midst of a storm or in the midst of just one of the most kind of significant, upbeat, positive moments of our life, that, that I would just... 
be able to step in there with you and say, God, you've promised peace. You promised joy. Would you bring it? I need it. And I pray that you today, even before we jump into the message, that you would experience in ways that maybe you can't even describe what I experienced when I was little, of being in the middle of a storm and seeing blue skies, being in the middle of a storm that brings destruction and feeling peace and stillness. Let's pray. God, thank you for the promise that you are a good father, that you love and that you care. Um, Thank you that uh, you put yourself on the line, that you promised things for us. And uh, and so we, we ask for peace. We ask that we would taste joy, that you would lead us on a journey that allows us to arrive at those places and spaces where we can taste the peace and the joy that you have for us. And so um, may even in this moment, may you allow it just to wash over us and to fill us and to surround us and to comfort us. I pray that um, for some of our loved ones who uh, we're currently thinking about, uh, whether who are in the midst of sickness or struggle, that you would allow that peace and joy even even right now to just wash over them wherever they are. And then, uh, God, for the story of just the hurricane, I'm reminded that there are currently people um, south of us and uh, in the Caribbean who experienced a storm recently. And uh, that storm, that reality, a literal storm is still affecting them. And so I pray that we would... um, that we as a church would continue to be generous in how we're engaging in that, uh, that mission project with um, bringing water and food and shelter, that we pray right now that they would experience peace and joy in the midst of their um, dark storm as well. So we love you. We're grateful for the opportunity to sing, to celebrate, and to know and to claim a promise that you've given us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. You can have a seat. Encounter Church, and uh, today we're going to finish up a series called Guardrails, and uh, this idea of guardrails, just to recap for you, if maybe you're here for the first time today, or you've been at one of these guardrails, this idea of guardrails is putting things into our life, both external choices and becoming sensitive to internal voices that um, allow us, that's what these guardrails represent, that can help both direct and protect us in life. And we talked about putting guardrails in our thought process, putting guardrails in our friendships, uh, just in general. And one of the, the things, I hope this, this has been an encouraging series and a helpful series, but I recognize that as we were wrapping up the series today, I was like, there are so many different areas where this idea of guardrails hasn't been fleshed out. And so before we, we kind of wrapped up the series and move into this November series called Address the Mess, um, that will be really fun um, and really real. Uh, we wanted to kind of say, let's just dig in a little bit and get super practical and, and just kind of engage guardrails just across the board. And uh, to kind of get started in that, I want to kind of tell you a story. There, in the 80s, I don't know if some of you were a child of the 80s and the 90s, but I was. And so there, were, there were, was good music back then. That's just my personal opinion. Really good music. And uh, there were really good bands and one of those bands was Van Halen, right? And if you're not familiar with Van Halen, Google them, okay? They're, that's the power of the internet age is that they're still around in all of their um, glory on YouTube. And, uh, and so the Van Halen was known, uh, 1984, they're this, this kind of groundbreaking tour. They're traveling all around America, and they are the, like, the biggest show in rock history, KISS is the only other band that compares to Van Halen. And Van Halen is innovative, they're inventive, they're, they're breaking through barriers that no band had ever seen. In fact, you would have where a typical rock band tour would have one, 
wasn't just Mack truck or 18-wheeler carrying all their supplies. Van Halen would roll up with a whole fleet of them. I mean, these guys had a thousand lights. When most bands were just starting to flirt with the idea of having lights in their show. And Van Halen would have a stage that would move and shift and the lighting rig would sway. And so it was this incredibly insane experience for those who got to taste it. And so, but one of the things that Van Halen was known for was also this idea that they were prima donnas or divas. In fact, one of them that's uh, kind of this famous story involves what I have in my hand here. That uh, Van Halen had a writer and it was a 53-page document. And in that 53-page document, it would specify all the things that, that you had to have if Van Halen was going to show up. It would give you the technical things like the lighting and the stage and how the connectors were supposed to set up. But then there was um, also some weird things, like you would move into the food section, and the food section, just to literally read some of the things it would say, they would say they, would want it, they wanted a variety of donuts, they wanted a dozen hard-boiled eggs, they wanted Fruit Loops and Raisin Brands, they wanted real knives and forks, not plastic ones. On even days, when their shows fell on even days, they wanted Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, mushrooms, and spinach. On the odd days, if it happened to fall on odd days, they wanted peas, green beans, corns, carrot, corn, carrots, and tomatoes. And the list would just keep going, going on from there and there. They had traditional rock band kind of mentality, whiskey, beer, and wine. But then they had a section of food that was a subsection called the munchies. And in the munchies, they would want potato chips with assorted types of dips spelled out for them. They would want specific types of nuts and pretzels. And then in the middle of the munchie section, okay, so remember, this 53-page document, you would get to the munchie section, and there in the middle of it, in all capital letters, underlined in, in parentheses, it would say this, warning, absolutely no brown M&Ms in the jar. And this idea of the brown M&Ms um, kind of caught culturally. It's still like talked about today in that performance culture where it's like, well, we're not Van Halen. We're not asking you to take the brown M&Ms out. Right? Because literally, you would buy a bag of M&Ms and then someone would have to sit back there and pluck all of these out. And, and the idea was that, oh, that's just David Lee Roth. That's Van Halen. They're just divas. But it was actually quite brilliant. You see, it was a 53-page writer that would specify all the specifics. And those thousand lights and the moving stage and the grid above and the light towers, that was actually quite dangerous. We go to rock concerts today and we don't even notice all the intricacies that's happening on a stage. But before Van Halen, no one else was doing it except for Kiss. But Kiss wasn't even as breakthrough innovative as Van Halen was. Van Halen literally invented what we call the modern rock show. They, they built the idea of the moving stage and the light rigs that move and the thousand coordinated lights. Like, that was their idea. And like anybody who's doing breakthrough innovative things, it's also dangerous. And David Lee Roth, after having some, some series of incidences where things would get really kind of hairy or dangerous for the team, came up with a brilliant idea. He said, let's embed inside the rider a guardrail a test that when I walk in, I go straight to the dressing room and I'll know instantly whether or not we're stepping into a safe zone or a danger zone. So David Lee Roth would show up, he would go to his dressing room and he would look to see if there were any of these in his M&M container. Chances are if the producer, the house producer who was in charge of putting all those things together had read it and read it in detail, then there was no brown M&Ms, and it probably also meant that all the lights were hooked up correctly, all the moving stage pieces that had been assembled correctly. But if he walked in and he noticed brown M&Ms in his M&M container, he knew instantly that something was wrong. And David Lee Roth would call, call a halt, uh, like a hard stop, a halt to everything, and they would not step on stage until every single connection, every single light, every single tower was double-checked. You see, for David Lee Roth, he was okay with people thinking he was a diva because he realized it actually served him. It protected him and his crew. And the brown m and stuck, and they worked. And this series around guardrails is this really practical notion of what, is, what are those brown m and that we have in our life to direct and protect us, to alert us 
when we're starting to get into dangerous places in our finances, in our relationships, and maybe in our marriage or, or, or in parenting or our career? Like, what are those brown M&Ms? And David Lee Roth, in the midst of all of that genius, was actually, I think, just swimming in the same stream that he would have heard about growing up. You see, David Lee Roth was, um, was born Jewish, and part of his, um, actually, he learns to sing, right? Part of Van Halen's story of him being such a powerful singer is he, he kind of has this breakthrough moment preparing for his bar mitzvah. That's where he starts singing. And, but growing up in his bar mitzvah, he would have had to learn certain texts. He would have had to absorb certain Old Testament truths and scriptures. And one of them would have been the book of Proverbs, which uh, throughout this series I've gone back to. It's one of my favorite books. And the book of Proverbs is this really powerful passage, um, Proverbs 20, 27, 12. And um, if you downloaded the Encounter Church app, you click on message notes or Bible, it'll already be there for you. And if not, you can just read it on the screen. But it's this simple sentence that I think even as a young boy, David Lee Roth would have internalized through his bar mitzvah for kind of ceremonies and training. It says, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. That the prudent see danger and they take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Both see danger, but how they respond makes all the difference. It's their response to the danger that ends up qualifying them as prudent or foolish or simple. Because simple is, is used interchangeably for the word fool in uh, the book of Proverbs. And so today, um, what I wanted to do was offer up kind of a different uh, approach to how we typically do the message. Um, I recognize that there's so many different guardrails, and I was like, how do, we, how do we wrap up the series in a way that just kind of puts some flesh and life to it? And so our thought was, um, I'm going to engage with someone that I, uh, probably of all people on planet Earth, um, is probably one of my biggest heroes, and who I have the most respect for, um, who I, I think is like, secretly is most people aren't even aware of the depth of wisdom and knowledge and insight and genius. And um, I, there's just so many gifts and there's so many abilities and there's so much hard work and integrity. I was like, I want to bring someone like that up on stage to help me unpack this issue of guardrails. And as fortunate that um, normally this person would never speak on stage because they hate the stage. Um, and so I'm going to ask you to be very encouraging to them and very gracious to them because this is not what they do typically. Um, but because I happen to be married to her, I could kind of pull the I'm married to you card. I really need you. If you've probably done that before, like you got to do this or it all falls apart card. And so I'm excited that you're going to get to hear from the one and the only Jenny Causey. Come on out, Jenny. And um, for those who don't know, maybe you've never even met her, this um, lovely woman is my wife. Uh, we've been dating for 13 years. We've been married for about 12. Um, and it's been an incredible journey. And everything I just said is exactly true. Uh, she is wise and she is thoughtful uh, I am so grateful that she is the mother of my daughter because that means the 50% of bad that came from me got diluted with the 50% of really good from her, or at least that's my hope. <laughs> so we'll see how that plays out. So um, what I wanted to do, you can have a seat, sweetie. Um, what I wanted to do is for us is to talk through guardrails, like get really kind of nitty gritty practical for how we do guardrails. Now here's the disclaimer, Okay. Go ahead and give you a disclaimer. This is descriptive, not prescriptive. And what I mean is we're going to describe the guardrails that we have in our family and in our relationship, but it's not prescriptive, as in you hear it, you should do it. Guardrails are very nuanced in your life, your season. We've got people at different stages, different seasons, different places in life. And so not every guardrail that you hear would be prescriptive, that you could just pull it into your life. The hope is that as we're dialoguing about guardrails, you may, it may trigger a thought for what a guardrail could look like for you. Um, and maybe kind of lead you on a rabbit trail that could help you um, kind of install something like this in your life. Because I do think that many of our regrets, right, if we're going to live a life of better decisions and fewer regrets, um, oftentimes most of the regrets we have could have been prevented had we had something like this in our life. Had we had some uh, external boundaries or had we listened to the internal voice telling us, this is a bad idea. I see danger. And if we'd, like Proverbs 27, 12 said, if we just stopped and responded to the danger instead of moving forward into the danger, some of us, myself included, would, would not have some of our deepest regrets. 
So um, we're going to jump in and kind of process uh, through that. And so we're going to start off with a very easy one, one that I know you all have figured out, um, but that we're still working on, the area of communication, right? Because I know that no one, no one in here has that problem. So you're going to serve as counselors for us as we dialogue about it. Um, but we're going to start really simple. Like, uh, and again, descriptive, not prescriptive. This is just our response to this passage in our lives. Hello? Is this on? Oh, okay. I can hear it. All right, great. So I, I think the microphone was so excited, it just dropped it, like dropped the mic. So anyways, um, thank you for your, you know, like I said, we have communication problems, right? It's just a very obvious. I can't even do this right. Um, so let's talk about some of like a very simple um, guardrail that we put in um, right after we got married. So one thing that, that we started and that we continue is that we never have a television in our bedroom. Um, it just uh, it keeps us from just kind of like not, not talking to each other. Um, and then we also don't have the television on just on, like as background noise in the house. Um, we have we both have people that we love and care about that we've seen just kind of when they're home, they're just watching TV, and there's just not that intentional time together. And so, um, you know, when it's on, we're sitting down together, like as a family, the three of us, or just the two of us watching it. It's not just on. Um, and so that's just something that's always been helpful to us. And, and, and that sounds really simple. We just think that the bedroom should be used for other things, like sleeping and talking, right? And so that just has prevented us from having those mindless moments or those kind of just... Because I've seen people veg out. They sit in front, and what happens is slowly over time, the relationship erodes because communication is the lifeblood. Okay, that was really easy. That was really simple. Um, let's move into something that everyone else already has figured out, too. In our house, we call them discussions, all right? Maybe in your house, you call them fights or arguments or battles, um, however you want to call those things. Um, we call them discussions. And... Uh, both of us, really, I, I didn't grow up in, in a context where um, I grew up in a single-parent home, and uh, my, the crazy, crazy drama before that, there was a lot of abuse in what I grew up in. And um, so that kind of left some, um, that ghost of abuse kind of haunted my household. And so typically what that meant, because there had been physical, verbal abuse, um, the, the ghost of that was passive. Like we didn't deal with conflict. Uh, if it was, it was not normally not necessarily healthy. And um, so that kind of left a mark. So I kind of stepped into this thing, not necessarily knowing what I knew or didn't know. I just knew whatever I'd pictured in my head probably wasn't right. And so we had some people who stepped in and helped us establish some guardrails who were mentors for us. Um, and so let's talk about our discussion guardrails. So when we have our discussions, we make sure that we stay away from certain words like always and never because generally you, you, that's, those words kind of indicate an attack on the other person. So, and, and we try to stay away from like raising our voice and using sarcasm. Um, sar sarcasm for both of us just doesn't, doesn't work. And, um, and even like when we're having discussions sometimes, if one of us recognizes that like, snarky, sarcastic tone starts to come up. We even have um, like movie lines that we'll quote. I know it sounds weird, but um, like they're from like Dumb and Dumber. Um, Profound movies. Yeah, like it just kind of diffuses and, and helps us realize like, oh, that this really isn't a big deal and I'm getting really worked up about it and it works for us. So just kind of being mindful of how we, how we discuss and having off limits words and things like that. Yeah, the other one is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Um, because of Margot and Todd, if you've ever seen the movie, they're like the perfect living picture of this like passive aggressive angry couple, right? And so we normally will just say one of their lines and it's like, oh, yeah, we're acting like that or I'm acting like that. Um, and then it, we normally laugh and it gives us a little bit of a break and it prevents us because what happens, this was a really profound uh, illustration for us early on. Um, what happens in relationships is that some, usually there's like a decision, right, or there's a disagreement, 
at the heart of, or a miscommunication at the heart of the discussion, right? And it catches you off guard, and sometimes it's systemic, sometimes it's just out of the blue, but what happens is something happens, and that thing kind of comes in between you, and you start talking about it, and you start getting frustrated about it. And what happens, though, subtly, is that uh, this, this disagreement, this discussion point, this decision one of us has made, typically me, quite honestly, um, starts to kind of drift away, and it gets personal. And that's when you move from the decision to you always or you never, right, which is a guardrail. Instantly, we're like, okay, we're, because none of us always or never anything. Like, we're, none of us are that consistent in anything in our lives, right? And so it's like, okay, that's probably not accurate. But what happens is when this, when this kind of gets down is it starts, it gets personal, right? Then you start like, it's your mama, that's the problem. I mean, things just start escalating. It gets all like, you know, you start pulling up stuff from decades before, and it's just not healthy. And what we got early on that was just really helpful is say, hey, um, and I'm doing this because literally this is sometimes what we do. And um, we'll say, okay, this is the issue. This is our problem. This is the stupid choice I made. This is the disagreement. And I'll sometimes physically, because what happens, with, we'll, go, we'll start like this. I don't know if you've ever done that, where you're going back and forth. It's like face to face. And I'll just say, okay, pause. And, and we'll kind of like get side by side. And we'll say, look, the issue is this. this I bought a boat, Right? Not really, but you know what I mean. Sometimes you come home and you're like, hey, I bought that boat today I've been never talking about with you. And um, it's, it's, it's on its way, right? And um, I ordered that Tesla online. I hope you're okay with that. And it's like, well, let's talk about that. And, and by keeping it on the forefront by dialoguing, what it does is it reminds us, even in our body language, that we're not the issue. This is the issue. And this, I mean, this sounds cheesy. Like I said, this is descriptive, not prescriptive. But one of the things in those moments we'll say is, like, we're team causing. Right? No one else on planet Earth has promised what we've promised each other. No one. I have not made that promise. I've made to her to anyone else on planet Earth. And I'm like, we're a team. Like, we're in this thing together. We're, if we don't like what we have, it's our fault. We built this thing. And if we've got a problem, it's our problem. And we can, if we've built this problem, we can probably build a solution too. So it's like, let's work together, team calls you to figure out how to do this. And that just simple reset, I'm telling you, that simple guardrail has, has protected us from going down what could have been very easily a really kind of, kind of nasty trail. Like anger and passiveness never mixes together well. And this prevents us from kind of going default in some of our responses. Um, and so that was, that's just been really helpful, those guardrail words. Um, but what's some other kind of guardrails around this discussion? Um, we, we try to, at, as much as we can, limit having these discussions late at night. Um, because when you're tired, you just, just can't be as rational as you probably need to be. Um, so we try to, even if we have to say, okay, we've got to talk about this later. We just can't finish talking about it tonight. And, um, and that works for us because we also have the same guardrail, uh, another guardrail of not ever going to bed angry at one another. Um, and so because we're able to keep it about the issue and not each other, we can say, okay, we, we, we're, we're just going to talk about this later, but are we okay? And every night before we go to sleep, we'll pray together. And so it's really hard to pray with someone who you're angry at or not okay with. And so we'll check, you know, are we okay to pray and go to sleep on this? And, um, you know, and if, if it's one of those things where we're not, like something has happened and we're not there, then we'll keep uh, going with it. But if we can, we'll try to you know, say, okay, I'm good with you, you're good with me, we'll, we'll pray, and we'll talk about it later. And for those who are like me, who struggle with pride, and, and have trouble saying, I was wrong, please forgive me. Like, if I am wrong is three words that you normally don't combine in your vocabulary. Let me help you. The prayer part is really helpful, because you can, you can tell God you were wrong, and she's listening in. You're like, God, I was wrong, Please forgive me. Help me to be a better husband. Like I've said, literally, there are prayers that we've had where I'm like, okay, I don't want to tell her I was wrong. I'll tell God and she's listening in. That's helpful. You know, at least I'm like being honest about it. And, um, but 
those two things have um, just these discussions around guardrails. Because look, we we've had to really like test these guardrails. There are nights I think back through our relationship where um, our commitment to stay up late always and like never go to bed angry has like been tested. It's there's a really important meeting in the mo- in the morning. Like I. I just need to be ready for that meeting. And it's like this, this thing is in between us, and I know we're not healthy. And I don't want to allow a crack to get into our relationship because I, I know what happens over time if you don't deal with something. You start to drift apart. And so, I mean, there's been nights where it's 1 a.m., and we finally kind of say, all right, we're here now because we said hurtful things or I did something that was hurtful, and we had to kind of come together around that. And at the time, I hated staying up late because I was tired the next day. But you know what I, I don't regret? Looking back on every one of those moments, I don't regret staying up late because of the strength of our marriage today. Because that was an investment that strengthened us, even if it meant I was tired the next day. And again, descriptive, not prescriptive, that not, may not be an issue for you. You may not be someone who falls apart at night like I do. Um, she could probably handle it a little bit better, but I can't. And um, so that's just been helpful, guardrail. So let's go ahead and pivot and talk about how we keep, like, us, because we, we have a kid, and so that child is pretty needy, um, demands to be fed regularly, wants attention to be paid. I mean, there's, like, all these things that's just required. And, um, but we recognize that, like, hey, we came first. Um, we're going to come last. And our job is to release you into adulthood prepared, not having you living in our basement until, like, we pass away and you inherit the house, right? That's not our goal. That's not our game plan. So let's talk about how we protect us. Um, So, like he said, we've been dating for 13 years. So when we got married, we didn't stop dating. And so we've been intentional about having regular date times. And even looking at our budget, we that's in our budget is the babysitting costs and the, um, you know, going away. Um, And so we've we've made sure to keep that intentional. And and depending on the season, it might be um, maybe a little less than than other times. Um, But even if it's having a date like at home after Ellie goes to bed, that that's um, been some, what we've had to do sometimes. Um, and then also getting away. Before we had Ella, we um, made the commitment to each other that we would still, like, get away together for, you know, periods of time, like a week or whatever. And I remember when she was six months old, or maybe seven, we we left her for eight days um, and with his mom. And um, we both cried on the way to the airport. Um, but for, I think, every year she's been alive, we have gone away for a chunk of time um, together and we were fortunate to have family that can take care of her and she loves it and they love it Um, but it's just a way for us to invest in each other and not to get lost in our role as parents um, but still realize that that we came first and when she leaves we're still stuck with each other so and when you have those getaway moments if you build that guardrail in I'm telling you like you remember I like you right if you're sitting beside someone Right, and they're, they're your boo, they're your special one, right? There was a point where you really liked them. And, and, and it's sad to say, but it's easy to forget that, isn't it? Life hits, schedules, pace, rhythm, demands, and you, for, you, for, you can forget how enjoyable and how they make you laugh or whatever. And, man, that's just been really helpful. And I'm not a big crier. And I still, just to, be, just to be candid, every time we leave Ella, I'm still like the weepy one. Jenny's like, whoo! got rid of her let's go you know and I'm like do you think she's gonna be okay and this last time we went away um we traveled internationally and uh in August we took an international trip five days and uh and the side benefit of doing that is you have to have your junk together right because you realize this is like the cabinet man there's a reason stay the unit dress people aren't all in the same building like one person's like off on the side designated survivor kind of deal, you know? And I'm like, we're the cabinet, and we're driving together, and we're traveling together. And so a residual benefit is that, like, our will is done, and it's always updated. Um, That we've thought through insurance implications of, like, what if the plane crashes, or what if there's a car accident? And I know this sounds morbid, but I'm telling you, it, it brings comfort to me knowing that, like, our daughter would be taken care of because we've thought through those things because of this guardrail. Um, even down to as morbid as it sounds, I already have my, I pick my songs for my funeral and have my final words written. Like, no joke. My funeral is already planned, and it's in an envelope that my mom has. 
And um, I have special words. I've, I've written something to her um, in case she survives. I've written something to Ella to carry her through. And I love it. I would, I would never do that. I would never, ever do that on any day. But knowing that guardrails in place keeps me grounded to think through those implications. Um, but let's keep going because uh, we're going to run out of time. So, uh, you know, we, we do um, also not just in our relationship. We want to foster. Um, we want to protect one another. And so uh, just a really brief thing. Uh, we, oftentimes, uh, someone who knows you really well can tell when you're starting to emotionally kind of go off course before you notice. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Like they know, even if you don't know, that you're falling apart. And for us, that's a, a guardrail when we see each other's tells, like, okay, that's a tell that you're, you're in a bad place. You're emotionally depleted. And we're walking through, um, without getting into details, we're walking through a really difficult family uh, journey right now. It's probably the hardest family experience we've ever had to go through. And um, just yesterday, um, we were kind of in the throes of it again. And I, I could tell it was really pressing hard on Jenny. And I said, hey, um, Ella, I've got her. Go. Go to the gym. Go do what you need to do. Um, just take a few hours and get away. Um, and it's not that I think you need to be away from us, but I just sense you need to emotionally recharge. And we're intentional about doing that for each other and being cognizant of each other's seasons and rhythms. And it also it helps give me daddy-daughter dates, which is a, another guardrail for our family, that I um, take Ella on dates and I ask her questions. I want to understand her heart and her mind because one of the unspoken, like, n not get into it too much, but one of our wins for parenting is that when Ella leaves home or any future kids that we have, we want them to want to come back. We want, we want our parenting relationship to turn into a friendship when they're adults. Just, just for dinner. Come back for dinner. Yes, not, yes, not. true. Not, not for good. Again, <laughs> peace out. Got to have a different address. And, um, but th that, that helps. That's one of those subtle things. But there's some other things that we do also in our family just at guardrails. Yeah, we try to um, have a, a rule of five meals together a week. Um, and ideally it would be dinner, but sometimes with the season it might be a breakfast or lunch. But we sit down together at the table and have five meals together um, and just talk. Um, and that's something that's, that if, if we realize that we've broken that, that's a guardrail for us that we need to reconnect. Yeah. And we're, we're just intentional about creating memories. I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff because of our time. Um, but uh, we really kind of one of our filters is creating memories in our family. And some of you, I know I talk to you regularly, and you do this. You take trips, you, you get away, you do these subtle things that really help to kind of foster these memories. Because at the end of the day, we don't want her memories to be of our family sitting and staring at a television screen, eating, eating like warm-up dinners from a microwave. And, and I, some of us have experienced that, and we want to create these defining moments that when they think back on their childhood, they think back on the richness of family. And so that's just one of those intentional things um, of going on family adventures, having family nights, flipping the couch over to watch a movie. And if we haven't done those things in a while, if we feel like there's this adventure kind of gap, then we'll take an adventure as a family together. Um, even in parenting, I'm going to fly through some stuff just to kind of hit it. But even in parenting, we've, um, especially for Jenny, have created margin around bedtimes. And um, that's something that for us has been really helpful, a set bedtime and a set wake-up time. You're not allowed to leave that room unless there's an emergency um, before 7.45. And it's because for Jenny in the morning, that's, that's the time she's reading the Bible, she's journaling, she's processing, she's thinking. That's her, like, drink her cup of coffee, no one demanding anything from her, breather. And she's a morning person. I am not a morning person. And so it's just really refreshing for her. And that owl that just wakes up and tells her it's time to get up now is, is awesome. And that's really allowed us, um, even in the team calls him mentality, to, to another guardrails when we see each other frustrated, um, we try not to discipline out of frustration or anger. So if we sense one's getting kind of upset, we'll kind of say, hit Hit pause. Let's tag. I'll jump in with this. I, I've got teeth teeth brushing tonight, because I can sense it's starting to like you're 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 done, and I'm not, and I'm good. Or she's like you're done, and I'm not, and we switch in and out. So last thing, and I'll let you, hit, and then we're going to be done, is around this issue of finances, because um, margin is a big deal relationally. You've heard that we take we take time apart. Um, uh, uh, from her to be able to get away. Um, we kind of create margin around these little mom-daughter -da dates, dad-daughter dates, um, that margin matters. And in finances, it matters too. 
And so you want to hit on the finances before we're done? Yeah. So we have, um, we have a percentage, a certain percentage of our income that we give, and then a certain percentage of our income that we save, and then we live on the rest of that. So instead of looking at our income and saying, this is all that we have to live on, we know that this percentage, you know, amount here is for giving and this percentage is for saving. And then even with that rest that we live on, we try to, to create as much margin as we can. And we make decisions that we might go without something um, because we know that we don't want that, that strain and stress um, that comes with maxing out your budget. Yeah, and it's been really helpful. Like one of our, again, descriptive, not prescriptive for us, we, we believe that when we read the Bible that one of the things that God desires for us is generosity, that we should be generous people. And that's something that we take seriously in our family of grateful people and generous people. And we want those to be marks of the last name Causey. If you grew up in this house, this is what defines us as, as, as a kind of a little tribe. And, uh, and we see that fostered. And, and I know for some of you, uh, I didn't really grow up in a Christian context. I didn't have quite the baggage. I saw televangelists, and they made me sick. Um, but for some of you, you probably grew up in church context where, like, money was the worst thing they, they ever could talk about. You went to church, and whenever they talked about money, it was like, what can I get from you was the vibe you got. You're like, they're just figuring out a way to get more money from me. As opposed to what we see when we read the Bible and when we practice just generosity is um, more about what God wants to do for us and through us as, as a people. And so um, that margin has made a difference. It's even this past week, we, uh, we looked at moving. Uh, we're getting ready to make decisions, uh, you know, just around like where we're going to live, uh, housewise and some of those details. And we were looking at a place that on, on paper and in person we loved. And the one catch was we had to erase all our margin. And um, we were, like, really wrestling through that. And we were like, we're not going to move this guardrail. This guardrail has been there for 13 years and has protected us. And if we move this guardrail, we're going to be floating, we're going to be flirting with the edge of that cliff. And I would rather us not have some things we have right now and have what we have than gain those things and lose what we have. And just having those guardrails has been really helpful. to Because remember, a guardrail both directs and protects. So I want to thank you. Thank you, Jenny, for giving me this time. I'm going to let you go back. Free school. And uh, I'm a big fan. Isn't she awesome? She was so nervous. She thought she was not going to be able to do this. And I was like, girl, you're so good. You're going to rock it. And she did. She rocked it. And I love her, and I'm grateful I get to do life with her. And uh, most of the stuff that you heard me say is out of her wisdom. So um, kind of as we wrap up this series, this is what I want to leave with you. Um, you kind of sense that um, through the series, we've challenged you to think about, like, what are those brown M&Ms in your life that give you that warning point that tell you, hey, I'm moving into a dangerous place. And we've looked at different things, and this morning this was meant to kind of just maybe kind of jog your mind to think about different ways and different areas of your life where guardrails may be needed. And so the way we're going to close out today is like we typically do, we, we end with a song, and that song is intended to just kind of be a space of response and a, a place of uh, kind of reflection of this simple question for today of like what are the guardrails that I need to have in my life? And maybe you've maybe some of the marriage discussion triggered thoughts about relationship, maybe uh, parenting, maybe your work, something came up with a relationship at your work. You're like, I need better boundaries. That's just not a healthy relationship. Um, maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's even just um, you're like, you know what? Every time I come to Encounter Church, I, I feel hopeful and it's really helpful. And maybe I just need to be better, kind of put some guardrails in, in my schedule to kind of protect this space. Um, or to make sure I'm listening on the app. And I would encourage you to go back on the app or our website and, and listen to the past guardrail, guardrail messages and just kind of digest it more because this matters. At the end of the day, these things direct us and protect us from the danger that could easily creep into our lives. And that's why we have these guardrails, not because we're perfect, but because we know how imperfect and broken we are. And we know in our relationship, if we didn't have them, we could easily get off course. And that at the end of the day, what I think is most important is, is not your opinion of me, is not the type of church I ever get to pastor. What matters most to me is that those who know me the best would love and respect me the most. And that those who know me the best and love, would love and respect me the most, and that starts in my home. So we're really intentional about those guardrails. Because to me, that's my definition of success, is what 
they think about me, not what you think. I hope I'm helpful. I hope I'm a dispenser of hope. But I care about their opinion more than I care about anyone else's. And when you know what's the most important thing for you, when you know what those important things are, then you can start to put guardrails around them to protect you. And that's what this song and that's what this time is intended to do. So maybe for you, it's clicking on starting point on the app or swinging by starting point after the service in the carpet square that we have set up to say, hey, I, 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 what's important is I need some people around me in community and I want to get plugged into a life group or I need some, um, I just have some questions about life and faith and I'm processing some, some brokenness in my life or I have some areas in my life where I've not forgiven myself and it's holding me back and I've got some bitterness. And we've, we've got a, a group for that as well, just to process through these issues of really substantial questions of life and faith and God and forgiveness and grace. Um, because we want to be a church where uh, that hope and that helpfulness carries into the week. We want Sunday to spill into Monday, and that's why we've created Starting Point, and that's why we have an app. So um, it's, uh, I'm going to invite you to stand, and uh, our band's going to lead us in singing. Um, this space is also carved out as um, a moment for those who, um, who call Encounter Church Home, who are regulars here, who kind of understood what I said earlier about being a generous people, that Encounter Church, we are a generous people. We're, we're speaking in to some of the... Um, some of the flooding and disaster relief with the recent hurricane that we're in, engaged with what's happening in Syria, that we are a generous people. We are a generous church because you're a generous people. And, and so we carve out that space for those who call Encounter Church Home to be able to give and as we pass a basket. But it's also that basket is there for maybe if you're here and you're a guest and, or, or maybe you're a regular and you're like, I want to I get plugged into serving or I've got a prayer request or I have some questions um, and you just write it on uh, the guide that you were handed when you walked in. That's that basket is for you to, just to be able to turn that in as well. So uh, the band's going to lead us and sing. I'm going to pray. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to call a little bit of a different kind of approach today. Thank you for allowing my wife to come up here on the day that they've had more preschoolers than they've ever had before. So that was pretty cool, but also really stressful for her. And because um, Jenny runs the preschool area here. So if your preschooler loves it, it's because um, of Jenny and her team. And uh, so it was kind of a stressful day for her. So thank you for letting us do this. Um, let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the mercy and the grace. Uh, thank you for the guardrails that you allow to put in place in our lives. And so uh, may even as we sing a song about the victory that you desire for us to have, the joy that you desire for us to have, the victory and in these spaces and places of our life of struggle, that we would... Uh, that we would hear and that we would see and that we would think with clarity about the potential of what a guardrail would look like, of to protect us and to direct us into those places of a life filled with better decisions and, and fewer regrets. And so it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
Church. We hope you found today's conversation to be both hopeful and helpful. Um, we would love to connect with you further. Um, if you're interested in learning more about a counter church or ways to get connected, please stop by Starting Point. We would love to connect with you. We hope to see you next week as we continue our series. Until then, have a great week. <laughs>